So, and also I mistook the audience. I've got the wrong talk. So I'm just going to skip through stuff and I'm going to add a little lot and hopefully say some things that are interesting to you and you won't find boring. Um, I'm, I'm a basic scientist. I trained originally as a vet and uh, I'm working up the street at the University of Melbourne. Um, gradually, University of Melbourne is, is moving downtown to take over RMIT, but it hasn't done it yet. Um, and we're, um, we're currently in an old building next to the new Brain Centre, which is that wonderful new building on Royal Parade. And this is our new building, which is now almost complete, and we're moving into it early next year. Um, that's the group in Melbourne next to it. We're funded by an NHMRC program grant and we work on immunity to influenza, particularly the T-cell response, which is the cell-mediated immune response. And then I'm also still involved uh, in a group with, uh, at St Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, T Tennessee, where we also work on influenza. And, um, and that, uh, that group, um, uh, this is a small group that I'm still involved with. I only spend a couple of months a year there. That group's funded by a very big uh, National Institutes of Health contract. It's part of a system of six contracts to work on influenza. It's worth about $50 million a year. And, and the reason that uh, they're putting this sort of money into influenza is that everyone got very scared with the bird flu back in the mid, uh, in about 2005, 2006. And there's very real concern about a possibly severe influenza pandemic. And I'm talking about pandemic infections. The main threat as a pandemic infection is always influenza, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we have regular influenza pandemics. We haven't had a truly terrible one for some time, uh, but everyone goes back to thinking about the 1918-19 influenza pandemic when somewhere between 50 and 100 million people died uh, worldwide, and it cost... Uh, uh, it, it cost many more human lives than the First World War and uh, undoubtedly helped bring the war to an end. It's, um, it still resonates as, uh, as what can happen uh, uh, with pandemic infections. Now, we're constantly challenged by infections that come out of nature and, and these come from, uh, principally, from animals and, of course, uh, uh, there was a discussion going on when I came in about uh, animals and human food and so forth. If we didn't eat animals, we'd probably be at less risk from pandemics. Uh, but they don't all come from domestic animals. They do also come in from wildlife, uh, though sometimes via the intermediary of domestic animals. That, that, that realisation that animals and us are very tightly linked when it comes to novel infectious disease has led to the development of, an area of, a, of a sort of way of thinking that's described as one health, and that is that the health of animals and the health of us are, uh, are vertebrate animals uh, but in particular, and the health of us are very intimately linked in various ways. And the most, most obvious way they're linked is in transmission of infections on the main from animals to us, but sometimes from us to animals. Uh, we can, for example, give pigs influenza. There's a... Uh, uh, pigs get influenza, we get influenza. Pigs generally get a major human influenza virus that's circulating and will actually keep that virus more stable than it is in us. And the reason for that is pigs don't live that long and so there's not as much need for the virus to change to maintain in pigs. Uh, I won't show you the picture, but influenza virologists can't, uh, like to show a picture of a little baby, a little kid, a, a toddler, kissing a pig. Uh, or licking the pig's nose, and everyone thinks, oh, the poor kid. But I was listening to Jodie McVernon yesterday, who's an epidemiologist who has small children, and she naturally thinks the toddler is the threat because she has to deal with these monsters, and she thinks the toddler's probably giving it to the pig, which is really quite likely, in fact. And in fact, in, um, and, and, and she showed a number of pictures of people at agricultural fairs. They're doing pig wrestling in the Midwest in America. You know, the middle of America is a very boring place and you have to find interesting things to do. We have lovely beaches and we have Sydney Harbour and, and we have Port Phillip Bay and, and all that wonderful stuff. But, but if you live in the middle of America, all you've got is mud and corn. And, uh, and so pig wrestling is a sort of thing that appeals to people because it gives them a bit of fun. And, and uh, we had an outbreak last year of 
what's called the Hong Kong flu, the H3N2 flu, which has been circulating in humans since 1968 in various forms. We had it going from pigs to humans. It was a variant that was in pigs. It had changed in pigs and it was infecting humans. But all humans that were infected were only infected from the pigs. But what we really worry about with these viruses is because they change so rapidly by mutation that the virus that goes from pigs to us will change in a way that allows it to spread between us and we'll get a new pandemic. And I'll show, show you an, an example of that. The 2009 uh, H1N1 flu was a pandemic uh, of that type. Now, we've had numerous viruses come across from nature over the last 50 years. You can read books about this. If you read about... Um, pandemic infections. There are books like The Coming Plague, Spillover, The Demon in the Freezer, Shock Horror, Be Terrified, We're All Going to Die. In actual fact, there are a lot of truly horrible infections out there. Hendra virus, uh, the virus that infects uh, horses from bats and then infects, uh, has infected a few veterinarians and, and veterinary nurses is exactly that. It's an absolutely hideous virus. It's probably the most horrible virus you can imagine. It destroys our blood vessels. We bleed to death internally. It's as though we dissolve. And, and Ebola virus is another one. We call these the hemorrhagic fever viruses. They're terrible, terrible infections. But so far, that virus which comes out of our fruit flats has probably been there all along. We've only just recognised it recently. And I think so far it's about four people have died. And so even though these horrible infections, these are not infections that are, going, are likely to cause pandemics. To cause a pandemic, that virus would have to change so that it transmitted readily between us, which would probably mean it would have to change so that it spread via the respiratory route, via, via sneezing and coughing. Think about it. You know, we can decide if, if someone's bleeding and that, uh, terrible, we can decide if we're a nurse or an ambo or whatever to wear gloves and a protective masks and pack, practice what we call barrier nursing. And barrier nursing will actually handle most of these infections. Uh, but if that virus goes to a ready spread by a respiratory route, we can't have much control over it. Even with a gastrointestinal infection, we can wash our hands, we can be very careful about touching objects and, and all that sort of thing, but you can't decide where to breathe. It's obligatory to breathe. You have to breathe. So you can't protect yourself by not breathing when you don't feel you should because it's not safe. And so that's why respiratory infections are really the big threat. So there are all these horrible viruses out there. The Sinombri uh, virus in, in the US, which comes out of mouse species and caused an outbreak in Yosemite last year, it was people getting infected by infected mouse droppings when they were staying in cabins at Yosemite. Now, it sounds disgusting, infected mouse droppings. We all get exposed, exposed to things like rat droppings and mouse droppings and mite dust and might crap and all the stuff all the time. I mean, we live in a constant uh, interaction with animals. I, I think someone said if you live in a city, you're never more than about three metres from a rat. And that's probably true, actually, but the rat's probably under there somewhere and you don't see it, so you're not really conscious of it. So, so we're all very close to animals all the time. And mostly, of course, we're not getting infections from them. Um, we don't know. Sometimes infections that have really been quite, quite stable... And, and, and limited in their host range can suddenly start to spread. That happens with some of the mosquito viruses. You see the virus up there called chikungunya. Chikungunya is an African virus. In the, in the language of the community it comes from, it means he who bends over. And, and it means he who bends over because the person is in so much pain. It, it's like Ross River virus. It causes joint pain. It causes uh, polyarthritis with rash. And it's actually very similar to our Ross River virus. That virus, for some reason, a few years back, started to spread. And it went to Malaysia, Indonesia. It's gone up into Italy. And uh, we're just waiting to actually uh, to see whether it will establish in, in uh, mosquitoes here. It's a mosquito-borne infection, what we call an arbovirus infection. It grows in us. It may grow in other species. And it also grows in the mosquito. And these infections, of course, are, are limited in their distribution. We don't normally describe this as pandemic infections because they're limited in their distribution because of the range of the mosquito. Uh, malaria is another one. We don't get malaria in northern Australia, probably because we don't have enough people up there and, uh, and because we keep good surveillance and we keep some mosquito control. Um, but some of these things do get around. Uh, um, yellow fever virus, of course, is an African virus. 
but it came across to the Americas in the slave ships uh, many, many centuries ago. And the conditions in the slave ships where you had water where the mosquitoes could breed and people were being bitten and you had the whole cycle existing on the ship. With air travel, you won't have that. But you can have a situation where someone can travel very quickly. They're infected with the virus. The virus is in their blood. And they can go from continent to continent. And there's still enough virus in their blood that if they're bitten by a mosquito at the other end, you can set up the infection. We saw something like that possibly in the United States in 1999 with a virus called West Nile virus, which is very similar to our Kunjan and Murray Valley encephalitis virus, which occasionally causes encephalitis here. It came into New York City in 1999. Nobody knew how it came in. Either came in in the arm of an infected traveler or an infected bird, because this is a virus which has a life cycle where it's ma largely maintained in birds and mosquitoes, a bird-mosquito life cycle. What people saw in New York City in 1999 was that crows were dropping out of the sky because it's a really terrible virus for corvids. And it's wiped out enormous numbers of corvid species, jays, robins and so forth, in the United States, and, and still does. And, and then we also saw flamingos dying in the Bronx Zoo, and we saw some people getting encephalitis. That's brain inflammation, and some people died. That virus took four years to spread across the United States in a bird mosquito life cycle. It's, uh, it's now right across the US, up into Canada, down into other parts of North America, where it wasn't in the North American uh, landmass at all. And now it's totally established, and there's no way we're going to get rid of it. Uh, there's a vaccine for horses, but not for people. It's commonly the case that we'll have a vaccine for horses. We've got a hender of vaccine for horses, but not for people. Why is that? Well, it could be that horses are more valuable. I don't think for many people they are. But, um, but, uh, uh, but really, it's because it's much, much cheaper to make a veterinary vaccine. It costs an enormous amount of money to go through all the safety testing we have to go through to make a human vaccine. Quite frankly, if I was a vet and I was working in Queensland and I, I thought I might encounter uh, Hendra virus, I'd probably stick myself with the horse one. That would be highly illegal. Um, <laughs> Who saw the movie Contagion? Anyone? This is supposed to be the thinking person's horror movie. Uh, it, it's a pretty good movie, actually. You know, most, most movies about infections and pandemics are absolutely absurd. You know, you have people turning into zombies, they grow sharp teeth, they, they have black stuff coming out of everywhere or green stuff, they die horribly. Uh, Contagion's pretty good. It, it's worse than any pandemic we've seen in our lifetime, or worse anything than anything we saw since, since the Black Death of the Middle Ages in the, the 14th century, for instance, where a third to the half of the people in cities were dying from infection. And this was in a rat flea life cycle. And of course, nobody had any understanding of infectious disease. We under, knew nothing about infectious disease, though. We had some concepts about hygiene, but we didn't understand infectious disease until Louis Pasteur in the middle of the 19th century. So we didn't understand what we were dealing with. And there were all sorts of things done. You know, they, you killed the witches and you killed the Jewish guys. Anyone who was different, they were probably to blame. Bad air. Um, eh? Bad air. Bad air, yeah. Oh, miasmas. Yeah, miasmas. Well, you know, this, and there's sort of half truth in that. Because you get miasmas, these sort of fogs or swamps. Swamps are where mosquitoes are. Mosquitoes are where malaria is, OK? And so, you know, that, that's, there's some truth in it. And, and, and I, I thought it was kind of crazy that um, the plague that hit London, the, the plague raged for hundreds of years. I, I've been, I was, we're not so long ago, ago at a, an, on a Greek island and we climbed up high and there was the ruins of a village. And that village had been abandoned in the 17th century because everyone had been wiped out by the plague. And so um, that's, uh, oh my goodness, we've gone... I don't think I'm going to get past the first slide anyway, so it doesn't really matter much. I mean, so. uh, good. Oh, now I've lost the pointer. Oh, here it is. Can anyone see the pointer on the screen? Yeah, OK, that's fine. Yeah, so, um, so, uh, so in the plague of London, you know, it's in the rat. And the, and the rat flea life cycle, they killed all the cats and dogs. Now, I thought that was totally stupid. Why would you kill all the cats and dogs? Yeah. But of course, it, it wasn't stupid because if you killed the cats and dogs, the fleas would jump to people. 
So it actually did, it probably did increase the, the, the infection of people. Uh, contagions, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's some things that are silly in it, but basically the, 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 the movie's well done. It's, it was directed by, uh, produced by, or directed by Steven Soderbergh, who's a good director. A medical uh, guy called Ian Lipkin uh, uh, was the uh, science advisor on it, and they actually listened to him. And, uh, and so most of it's pretty good. Uh, there's one thing that's uh, there's one thing I picked up that's a bit silly is that the the the, the well one thing that's a bit silly they seem to have about three people working on this problem and it's killing millions of people I mean the the basic <laughs> the basic theme is that uh, it's like the Hendra Nipah viruses we've got here and, and Nipah goes through from bats to pigs to humans and it's up in Malaysia and and both these viruses were were substantially worked out in Australia in Queensland and down at the uh, Animal Health Lab in Geelong. And, um, uh, and so, uh, um, no, what was I going to say? Yeah. yeah, they have very few people working on it. Uh, the, the, the basic theme is that Gwyneth Paltrow is a business lady and she's in Hong Kong and they have a dinner on the last night and the chef dresses a pig and the pig had been infected with this virus from a bat and he shakes hands with Gwynny, and then she's feeling rotten on the flight back to the US. She stops off in Chicago and has a bit of a liaison. She goes on to a home in Minnesota. Everyone who comes near this woman dies. I mean, you just have to open the cab door or, or wave at her, and you get it. I mean, nothing is that infectious. And then in the end, we see Gwynny with the top of her head taken off because she's dead, of course. I mean, it's not real Gwynny. She's still around, and, uh, um, and so forth. And then the woman who works on it, is the, the scientist, is the woman who was Elizabeth Bennett in Pride and Prejudice with Mr. Darcy uh, being uh, um, Colin Firth, the, the, the heartthrob of some years back. So anyway, anyway, she's a very good scientist. But she vaccinates herself, and then the next day she feels she's protected and goes and sees her dad. You know, vaccines take a bit longer to work than that. Yeah, so bat viruses. We've only become aware of these recently, in fact. And, um, uh, if you had asked, ask any virologist what viruses are important in bats uh, 10 or 15 years ago, they would have said uh, rabies type viruses, lissa viruses. Um, biting bats in the Americas bite cattle and they transmit rabies virus. You know, rabies goes into a lot, whole lot of species and it's transmitted by bite. Uh, the virus gets, you get bitten, it's in the saliva, it gets into your nerve fibres and you want to be bitten on the foot because you, not the face, because it travels slowly up the nerve fibres and gets to the brain. Why is it better to be bitten on the foot? Well, it's actually the one of the few infections that post-exposure vaccination works. That if, you're, you're, if it's not travelling too quickly, you can act, actually vaccinate the person after they're bitten and you can stop the infection. And that's about the only system where we use that. And that was discovered by Pasteur. So it goes right back to the 19th century. And... Um, and, the, and, and they're called lissa viruses, the rabies viruses. Now, we don't have rabies in Australia. That means that none of our carnivores, our dogs, our foxes, our Tasmanian devils, whatever, have rabies. But we have a lissa virus in bats, which has killed two people, including one kid recently. We have a lissa virus in bats that is so close to rabies that you can vaccinate our bat handlers against rabies. Uh, we have 300 licensed bat handlers in Australia. They're all vaccinated against rabies. You may not know one, but, you know, they're around. And, and if you ever get a bat in your house, get a bat handler to get rid of it because they carry Hendra and they carry this Lyssa virus, and so they can be quite dangerous. Um, but very few people get infected from them, so you don't have to be fight, frightened of fruit bats. I don't think I'd camp under a tree full of fruit, fruit bats, but... But, you know, you don't have to, we don't have to go and kill them all. Now, the worst pandemic virus is influenza. And the influenza is, is bad because it's so extraordinarily infectious. It, um, it's very infectious early. The virus grows very fast in the respiratory tract to very high concentrations. And, uh, and people are breathing out virus, coughing out virus, when they still feel reasonably OK. So they'll get on a plane and they'll fly, and they'll fly from one state to another or they'll fly internationally. And by the time they get there, they may be feeling worse, but they're till, still coughing and spluttering. And if they've got, really got influenza, they're going to feel pretty bad because it's a rotten infection and you really do feel bad. Um, are you at big risk on a plane from the flu? 
Uh, no, not really. Um, you're, you're at risk of people sitting within three rows of you. Uh, you're at more risk if you're in an aisle seat. So if you cower away near the window, it's safer. Uh, but it doesn't go through the air handling systems of the plane. The plane's air handling is really pretty good and, and you're not going to get it uh, or any respiratory infection we know of just through being on the plane. Very interesting point though. If we got, say, some truly horrible infection on a plane and we realised it while it was still in the air or before it had landed and we wanted to actually, uh, if we're really worried about it, we want, might want to put everybody into quarantine. Where would we do it? Uh, we don't have any quarantine stations anymore. There's a quarantine station across near uh, on, on Point Nepean, but it's long in disuse. Uh, the Sydney quarantine station's a conference centre. Um, we don't have an infectious disease hospital. Uh, Fairfield Hospital closed many years ago. And so uh, what would we do with them? One proposition is we would actually plop them in an aircraft hangar out of the airport. What could be more sterile than an, air, than an airport? You've got miles of tarmac, you've got a hangar, you've got people who can bring in portaloos and, and portable kitchens and all the rest of it, and that might be one way of confining them. In, them on the I, you don't want to be on a <laughs> you don't want to be on a plane that night. <laughs> Have you ever had a, been on a plane where one of the toilets gets blocked? <laughs> you don't want to be on a plane that long. Um, and uh, yeah, you could do that, or you could blow up the plane, which would, which would not be beyond the the realms of imagination for some of those movies. You know that, that the military would want to blow up the plane, um, and, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. Yeah, so flu. Um, this is influenza going across the United States. This is what we call the seasonal strain of influenza. The virus changes by mutation. These are viruses that are circulating in human. They change by mutation. And then you'll get this virus that changes by mutation going all around the world. And this is going across the United States. The red is influenza, not Republica. And, and basically, <laughs> like a lot of really bad things, it starts in Texas. And, um, and it's right across the states in six weeks. Um, yeah, well, one of the things, reasons we got a lot more money for influenza research when the bird flu scare came along is uh, George W. Bush was president, and Bush realised that even rich people get the flu. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's no protection against it. It's no protector of wealth or status or anything else. It's really bad. Though it's always worse in developing countries. Anything you care to name is worse in developing countries. It's just a fact of life. I mean, there's just not the systems to sustain what you need to do. Uh, we, we pulled a lot of people through the 2009 uh, uh, swine flu pandemic, which was an incredibly infectious virus, went around the world very fast. It was actually in Australia, we think, before it was first detected in California and Mexico. So it had already got that far. So they go around the world on jumbo jets just incredibly quickly. And um, um, the... Uh, now, again, I've forgotten my point. So, um, so that, that, that virus spreads with enormous split speed. And um, I was going to say something else, but, I, you know, I, George Bush. Oh, yeah, George Bush. He, he realised that rich people get the flu, and so he put a lot of money in. Uh, but actually, you know, to be, to be fair to George Bush, we're having World AIDS Day here at the moment. And to be fair to George, he also was the US president who put a lot of money and got the drug companies to sell drugs in Africa at a very low price. So he was part of that. He didn't try to stop it, and he actually helped, I think, in some ways. So, you know, a course of AIDS drugs uh, cost something like $1,000 uh, for a year at minimum, and I think they're selling it in the, in the, in the developing world. They're able to give it out for $10 or something like that, uh, largely because the, the, the drug companies allowed Indian manufacturers to make generic drug and get it out there. And then Bush also provided a lot of money. So if you mention the name of George W. Bush in Africa, he's actually very well regarded as, as, a, as a true hero. And, and the incidence of AIDS has been dropping. And that's largely because a lot of people are getting drugs. Not enough. And we're really worried about the situation because somebody has to pay for those drugs and they're largely being paid for by aid, uh, aid budgets, aid volunteer, uh, subscriptions, uh, people like Gates giving large amounts of money and, and of course our aid budgets are falling all over the planet. We've just cut US aid, Australian, uh, Aus aid completely, it no longer exists. And, and part of our aid budget of course goes to locking up refugees. 
that's really great aid, you know. You <laughs> take people and you lock them up. I guess they're protected. Yeah. Now, influenza is a problem because like HIV, it's a virus that mutates very readily. It's an RNA virus that has no proofreading mechanism. It throws off variants all the time. And if you've got an existing AIDS strain, and everybody, uh, influenza strain, everybody makes antibody to it, you'll get escape variants emerging. And every year or two, one of those escape variants emerges to the extent where it will cause a new, what we call seasonal epidemic. In actual fact, it's a new pandemic because it goes right around the world. The, the norovirus people use exactly the same, have exactly the same issue. They've got a virus that changes a lot and you get escape variants and it goes around the world. They call it a pandemic. Who knows about noroviruses? Nobody knows about them. These are the things you get on cruise ships that make you throw up, vomit. You have a lousy holiday. You feel as though you're going to die, but you get better. But they call, cause pandemics all the time. If you remember, earlier this year, I think Lee Sales, the, the, the uh, newspaper lady, uh, the, the um, 7.30 report lady was off sick, and she had, uh, she had one of these things. And then I got to New York, in New York City the next week and it had just landed there. So it, it's like flu. It goes around the world very, very fast. We have a sort of a, a different terminology for some reason, but they're all actually pandemic infections. The other problem with influenza, though, is, and we'll never get rid of it, is because it's maintained in water birds. It's bas the influenza viruses are basically diseases of water birds. And uh, they have a wonderful system for surviving in nature. Normally, they're quite mild infections. They're gastrointestinal tract infections. And, and they don't compromise the bird too much. But the bird in excretes the virus in its gastrointestinal content for about a week or 10 days. And then that virus, the flu virus, survives very well in nature. And just about all birds are susceptible, as are most mammals. I mean, we get influenza infections in seals. Uh, we had about, I think it was about 700 harbour seals in Boston died a few years back. We get influenza infection in whales, we get it in cats, uh, in, in, uh, in leopards and, and tigers in zoos, uh, people, pigs, and so forth. So they're very, very widespread infections. In nature, uh, in the wild, with one exception, and that's a virus we've just discovered in bats, they're maintained in birds and water birds. So it's a tremendous system for maintaining a virus in nature because you have a lot of birds on a, on a water source. Now, if the virus does mutate, they become virulent. That is, it becomes, mutates to kill birds. And they, it does that in domestic chicken populations. You may have just read we had to wipe out a whole chicken farm in New South Wales. And the reason for that is there was a mutant virus, a virus that was already here, that mutated. And a single point mutation, just one DNA change, one, one nucleotide change, can change a mild influenza virus to a highly lethal influenza virus. And in birds, when they're highly lethal, they're really lethal. And they kill within two or three days. The birds sort of go blue, cyanotic, and they just die. But one of the reasons that everyone was so terrified of the bird flu is because the bird flu guys are used to seeing that. And they were saying, if this happens in humans, we're in terrible trouble, and so forth. So, Here's the influenza viruses that are maintained in water birds. There's, um, uh, there's something like six, uh, 15, 16 different hemagglutinin types. Hemagglutinin is just the protein on the surface of the virus, and there's another protein called neuraminidase. The, you know, viruses only grow within living cells. They're obligate intracellular parasites. The hemagglutinin binds to the cell surface and gets the virus into the cell. And then the neuraminidase is an enzyme which cleaves the interaction with new virus progeny because you get millions more viruses made uh, want to get out of the cell. It cleaves that interaction, and so it can get out again. So we call it H and N. There's, there's 16 different H types in birds, nine N types. Uh, in humans, H1, H2, and H3 are the only ones that have ever become established to spread in humans. The Hong Kong flu is H3. Asian flu, which was around for a while, was H2. H1 is the uh, 1918 pandemic, the 2009 pandemic. H5, uh, largely in chickens, but of course since this H5N1, this virulent H5N1 emerged, it's uh, also infected a number of humans. Since uh, 1997, the H5N1 virus has infected about 600 people and about 60% of those have died. And this still happens and, and people die. The, um, but it hasn't changed. It's just spread between humans. 
We're currently facing a situation with a totally new virus that we've never seen before in birds or humans. It was called H7, it's called H7N9, suddenly emerged in northern China. And unlike the H5N1, which changed to be very virulent in domestic chickens and kill them rapidly, the H7N9 seems to be an inapparent infection in domestic chickens. But it's infected about 130 humans and it's killed about 30% of them. Uh, it's mainly killed elderly men. It's uh, most, most severe. And we're not quite sure where, why that is. We think one, re one reason that's been put forward is when, when Ch the Chinese men retire, they do the shopping. And, and the Chinese like to buy uh, live birds and kill them from live bird markets. And these are wonderful incubators for keeping these infections going. And we think that's one reason, because they don't just go and buy them, you know, they sort of hang out for a while and, and chat and all the rest of it. I mean, one guy didn't eat chickens at all, he died from it, he just went to buy fish. But the fish counter was right next to the birds, uh, where the birds were kept. And so we're worried about that virus, actually, because H7N9, apart from the fact that it's silent in the birds, so it's not easy to pick up where the birds are infected, and it's not as high an incidence in birds as we would expect. The other thing is that it's genetically, from its sequence, it's very, very similar to human viruses, the ones that circulate in humans. And we think it wouldn't take much to change to start circulating in humans. So all the big drug companies, uh, the vaccine companies, are making seed stocks for vaccines. They're getting the stuff ready so that if we had to make it, we could have to make it quickly. With the H1N1 2009, it took us six months to get vaccine out there. By the time we got vaccine out there, the vaccine virus was all around the world and most people had decided it wasn't a terribly bad infection. And so uh, uh, a lot of it was unused, in fact. Uh, initially, people were terrified, but later it... Uh, it, it, um, it, it, there was more vaccine than anyone needed. And so, um, uh, the, but now the technology for making these flu vaccines, largely because Bush did put in a lot more money and they're still going in, uh, the, the technology for making them has improved enormously. So we hope to be able to make a lot more vaccine very quickly and, uh, and using new technologies, that uh, not just the old ones, which required it to be grown in embryonated eggs, which was a very, very cumbersome method. It's still the way the CSL vaccine's grown. But if we could grow these things in the usual methods of fermenters and all the rest of it, we could actually get a lot more out more quickly. So we're in a much better, uh, better place with regard to, uh, to making flu vaccine fast. And that's what's happening in a lot of this stuff. There's not necessarily enormous intellectual advances, but there's a lot of technological advance. There's a lot of technological advance in making product much more quickly that's effective. Uh, there's a lot of technological advance in, in diagnostic techniques. When the SARS pandemic hit in 2002, it took several months to work out that the virus causing it, which it came out of bats and went into a little animal called civet cats, then went into humans, there was a lot of... Uh, 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 it took about three months to work it out. And that was with the World Health Influenza Network working on it, which is a very sophisticated group of labs. Uh, but it took us several months to really sort it out. Now, with using low stringency PCR probes, you can pretty much screen for the whole world of viruses as we know them fairly quickly. And we probably pick that out much more quickly. So everything is getting better on the technological front all the time. That doesn't mean we can't get a pandemic. But if we, a bad pandemic, but if we did, we probably recognise it very early. And the earlier you recognise something, the better you can deal with it. The only problem is influenza. Influenza, even if you do recognise it fast, it'll still get everywhere. And, uh, you know, there's really not a lot of point in shutting down air travel with influenza because uh, it just goes anyway, as far as we can see. And there's real challenges if we get a bad influenza pandemic. Um, that's just talking about uh, the other way that uh, viruses emerge, and this is how they come out of nature often, is that the influenza virus genome is in eight different bits. And if a cell gets infected simultaneously with two different flu viruses, those, those bits will all repackage and you'll get a novel flu virus out. And that's where H3N2 came from in 1968. This was the H2N2 Asian human flu that... Uh, repackaged with an H3N8 virus from a duck. So it could have been in the lung of a pig or the lung of a human, 
got infected with the duck virus, got infected with the human virus, they mixed up and we got a new virus out. The 2009 uh, swine flu pandemic virus is actually a virus that is out of two uh, types of pig influenza. Now, one of the swine influenzas, the American swine influenza, is almost identical in some respects to the 1918-19 influenza virus strain. Though that virus disappeared in us, it was maintained, or some elements of it were maintained in pigs for over 90 years. And it somehow got together with the Eurasian swine virus. Now, we don't know whether that could have happened in a... Um, in a, um, uh, uh, it could have happened in a lab, but there's no absolute. There's absolutely no evidence that it did. Um, and you know whether it was a, an Asian pig on a package holiday in Mexico or something, but that's that's not likely. So we don't really know how those two viruses got together, but they clearly did. Now, I've used used a lot of my time, and of course our protection against um, against uh, influenza and against. Most, most, uh, vi most infectious pathogens, or most viruses particularly, is uh, immunization. And um, I won't go into any of this because I don't have time. But immunization works well against what we call systemic infections by pathogens that don't change. The vaccines against polio, measles, mumps, rubella, all those things are really good. And, uh, and, and if you think of polio, the way this virus works, the virus doesn't change very much. The virus comes in, it grows in the oropharynx up in here, and you're not even conscious of it. But in about one in a thousand, two thousand kids, the, the virus that gets into the blood gets into the brain and it destroys nerve cells and you get para paralysis because you can't replace those nerve cells. And so if you've got a vaccine that gives you antibodies in blood, and those will last for a very long time, for life really, then, uh, then you can block this virus because those antibodies will grab hold of it and destroy it. The real problem is with viruses like influenza which change all the time. If we've made the right antibody, that is we've got the right stimulus, the right antigen as we call it, you'll get good protection. But if it's not right and the virus has changed and it's mutated away from that, you won't get protection. Uh, and so uh, uh, you, get, you get escape. And, um, and there's a lot of challenges in vac vaccinology. With flu viruses, one of the things we're trying to do, or various people are trying to do, is, is the, the antibodies tend to get made against the highly variable regions of the virus. If we could make an antibodies against the more stable regions that have to be there because they're structural and they're accessible, then we could get a more cross-reactive vaccine. And so there's a lot of talk at the moment about trying to make cross-reactive vaccines. And a lot of people are playing with various genetic engineering strategies to try and make, uh, uh, make the immune response go towards these more, more uh, shared, shared regions on the, on the virus and, and try and get uh, better, better cross-reactive immunity. Um, there's also another little protein on the virus which is common, but that, that strategy hasn't been working awfully well. Um, I'll show you, this is the killer T cell. Not, we're not going to get to talk about killer T cells, but if the slide works, it, it's, it's neat. This, is a, this cell's going to be killed. Ah, if I can only get there. Oh, it's like, I'm getting too old for this. There we are. That, that little green cell is going to kill this big cell. And you're going to see it turn pink when its membrane integrity goes. That's what we'd like to do, cancer cells, with these killer T cells. And um, uh, that's what happens all the time in your body when you've got a virus infection. You have these immune cells bumping off the virus-infected cells. That has to happen because the viruses only grow within cells. They're factories that produce more and more virus. So you have to bump them off, and this is what this system is. That's what we got the Nobel Prize for, is discovering the basis of that, the focus of its trans... It's focused on what we call the transplantation antigens. The video is made by Misty Jenkins, who's uh, won one of the L'Oreal Women in Science Awards this year, who's uh, a great young person. Um, I'm not going to tell you any much more about, about immunology and stuff. Um, we'll get some... This is a primary... You talk about immunisation. This is... These are these... Um, well, I'll say a bit about this. I mean... The, the reason we're interested in these things from the point of view of vaccination is that this T cell, the killer T cell, the one that you just saw, 
via its specific receptor, and these are just as variable as antibodies, doesn't recognize viruses as such. What it recognizes is a little bit of the virus that's processed in the cell cytoplasm as the virus grows. Uh, bits of the virus are made improperly and they're chopped up and they're degraded, they're waste products. But it's presented in molecules called the strong transplantation molecules. These are the molecules that are involved in graft rejection, when we graft a kidney from one individual to another. Now, now why that's important from vaccinology points of view is that the, the proteins that these are made for are often internal to the virus. They're not under antibody-mediated selection pressure and they're much more conserved. And if we have a protein, or, or in this case it's a peptide, it's eight to 12 amino acids from the protein. If we have a peptide that's conserved, then of course we can make potentially a cross-reactive vaccine. And so there's a lot of interest in trying to use these things to make cross-reactive vaccines, these so sorts of responses. Uh, the problems with it are that um, the transplantation molecules themselves are tremendously variable. Though many of us in the room, if we're of, of Caucasian background, we will have one called A2, which is very common in Caucasian. Now, A2 with influenza actually presents one of these peptides which is shared across many, many influenza viruses. So we think that the fact that A2 is very prominent in Caucasians could reflect selection by influenza over the centuries that's tended to bump off people that don't have A2. And so that we've selected. And it's very likely that our genetic history in these transplant molecules and other things reflects the selective pressures exerted by viruses. You know, just from a cold scientific view, it would have been great to have, have sampled the transplantation types of the South Americans before the Spaniards arrived and before they brought smallpox and measles and all the things that caused us devastation in South America, the Polynesian Islands, and of course in our own Australian indigenous population. It turns out that in the Australian indigenous people and in the Alaskans who are very susceptible to influenza, A2 is not common. And, and one of the, the thing that is common, the, the transplant molecule that is common, doesn't pre present the cross-reactive one. And that may be why they, they are very susceptible to flu. Uh, we're just, uh, that's just been found recently by my colleague Catherine Kuziaska. The other problem with the uh, priming up the immune system for uh, T cell responses, though, is that the T cells have to get going. With, when you've got antibodies made by vaccination, they're in the blood all along. There are cells called plasma cells sitting in the bone marrow, just pumping these things out all the time, uh, whether you're exposed to the infection or not. With the T cell, you have to re-stimulate them. You don't want cells going around your body all the time that have the capacity to kill other cells. These are kind of nasty cells. You want them only for a very specific purpose for a very short term, time. And there's a lag phase in getting them going again. Um, if you look at the top, this is cells coming into the lung, and the top right quadrants, those blue masses, are the immune T cells coming into the lung of a virus-infected mouse, in this case. Um, the mouse below has been primed so that it has memory, as we call it, it had been vaccinated. But you can see the cells are only there a couple of days earlier because you have to re-stimulate them and get them going again. That can w help with flu because, uh, because if you can stop flu two days earlier, it, it will be a much less severe disease. But it's no good with HIV, and they tried this type of strategy with HIV. It didn't work at all, because once HIV gets in, it copies back into the genome, and that you've got no really possibility of handling it and, uh, and getting rid of it, unless we use some very, very fancy genetic strategy, which may be the way to go with HIV beyond drugs. We've, of course, been enormously successful with HIV with drugs. As long as people can afford them, they can get the triple therapy, ha HIV is handled pretty well. You may not live, be quite as healthy, you may have more cardiovascular problems, but you don't live a bad life. Uh, but uh, with, um, with vaccines, we've got nowhere. I mean, there, there are claims from time to time, but they're really not very promising, and, and the whole vaccination thing has just proven too difficult. And there may be some things that technologically we just can't do. The other possibility, though, with HIV is to use some sort of genetic strategy to actually sterilise the infection in the body. And people talk about interfering RNAs and all sorts of things. And, and I think that uh, there may be some potential there. Uh, we know we can. If you, if you give uh, someone a bone marrow transplant, uh, cells from a person who's not susceptible because they don't have the main receptor for the virus, you can actually, uh, you can actually cure them. But you know that is, that's so expensive and it's so dangerous and, and it's not feasible as an approach. Anyway, 
I'm going to leave it there, and uh, there's all this other wonderful stuff that I would have inflicted on you, but you're lucky, and I'm not going to. Um, and uh, if you want to know about pandemics, I've just published a book on it. It's a question and answer book called Pandemics, What Everyone Needs to Know. This book's about chickens. That was published last year. Uh, sentinel chickens are the birds that you park around the countryside to be bitten by mosquitoes so you can bleed them to tell you how insect-borne viruses are moving around the world. Um, the, um, and that's, that's Melbourne University Publishing, so it's, uh, it's available. The pandemics one's very hard to get, actually. It's written for Oxford University Press in New York, but they don't seem, Oxford doesn't seem to be all that interested in selling books in Australia. That seems to be too small a market or something. Uh, Warren Bonnet at Embiggen, Embiggen Books, which is just down in a little Lonsdale Street, uh, is, uh, is, has actually been importing it. Um, does everyone know Embiggen Books? If you're a Melburnian, you have to go to M. Biggin. I mean, Warren's just a great guy, and, and it's a terrific bookshop. And there's no New Age crap or any of that stuff. <laughs> and uh, so, thank God. Um, yeah. And, and this, is, this is a Q&A book. Uh, the, the books are usually, they're usually things like Modern China, what everyone needs to know, the Catholic Church, what everyone needs to know. Um, metaphysics, no, I don't know if it's one of them. I don't know what metaphysics is. Um, and, and, um, and usually they're kind of accessible topics. You know, we all know about the Catholic Church because we all read Dan Brown. But, um, <laughs> or we know about China in a sort of way, or economics. But the trouble with infection is people don't know about infection. And, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's really, really an issue, actually. Um, for instance, you will often read in the paper, you will read, a vaccine described as a drug. Now that is the most basic mistake. I mean, a vaccine is something you give to promote an immune response. A drug is a, a chemical that you give to treat something and it washes out with its fluid half-life. You'll, you'll see bacteria and malaria described as viruses. And it's, uh, it's really kind of distressing because there are just such fundamental differences in this. So one would hope journalists would read it, but you know journalists can't read. And so, um, <laughs> Writing a Q&A book, too, is an odd experience. I mean, writing a book's always an odd experience for a scientist because when we're writing research papers, we talk to each other all the time. We go back and forth, and it's, it's very collegial. It's very interactive. Uh, lab life is very interactive and sort of supportive. But, um, but writing a book, you sit in a room by yourself and you write. And, and think about it. You sit in a room by yourself. You're not only writing, you're inventing questions and then inventing the answers. There's no surer path to madness. So, so, so thanks, uh, thanks for hearing me out. I'm sorry, I've got to shoot off very soon. So even if you want to uh, tell me how stupid I am, it's because uh, we don't have much time. Um, <laughs> I know you have to shoot off. What time is it? Have you got enough? Is there any time for questions? Yeah, a little bit of time. Yeah. Okay, so we've got enough time for a couple of questions. But please keep the questions brief. Please put all the lights on. You must have lights on. I can only just stimulate that many lights on. <laughs> okay. yeah. I'm, I'm reluctant to bring up the anti immunisation but it seems <laughs> like the general view that I, that I can gather from it all is that the, the good that's done by immunisation is for the general population, vastly overweight. Over it's, it's, you know, it's, it's part of the problem of the general perception of, of evidence-based reality. You know, everyone, everyone, um, everyone's concerned about it. I mean, Al Gore wrote a book about it. We're, it's the retreat from reason, if you like, the retreat from the enlightenment type that is. That, that, uh, and of course, this gets so ramped up through the internet. And so forth. So, yeah, there's a, there's a risk with vaccination, uh, a finite risk. Any medical procedure has a finite risk. Okay, but we're now living into our 90s when we used to die in our 60s or 70s, and so that risk benefit is all in favour of the therapy, whatever it is. And and with vaccination, the risk benefit is absolutely overwhelming. And the one that everyone was so worried about was MMR, measles, mumps, rubella causing um, autism. And that was a very bad paper with only 11 subjects, which it turns out was selected subjects. You know, basically, you don't do that. It's been protracted. Uh, well, by the majority, but not by the principal of them. And, uh, and there's been an enormous amount of work done. But still, there's a lot of people who believe in this uh, with passion. And so things never go away. Uh, once it's out there, it will be there forever.
and, and then we're just going to have to deal with it. And so the issue of how we communicate science, science communication, I think personally the best science communicator in Australia is <laughs> Tim uh, there was uh, a Radio National sorry, uh, Rear Vision program just recently, you may have uh, heard of it, on pandemics, and uh, they made the claim there uh, that uh, most deaths from uh, pandemic flu are actually from secondary infections, not from the, the viral infection itself. Uh, if, insofar as that's true... Um, that's true of a lot of deaths in flu, which is why I think, Tim, that if we ever had anything equivalent to 1918, we'd do a lot better with it. Because a lot of the deaths then I think are pretty certainly due to secondary bacteria. Uh, unless and until our antibiotics go down the toilet, which is well, they're going down the toilet fairly quickly in some senses. But but where are we going to get a pandemic from? And one we worried about is, is, is multi drug resistant, total drug resistant TB. Because we had TB before, it would strike through the world. Not everybody died of it. We didn't wipe out the human race. I, I can't see a pandemic. You know, what's the emergency show? I'm wiping up human race, but there's too much of science, and, uh, and we're smart. But, you know, that when we released mixing virus in Australia, uh, we wiped out 98% of the rabbits in the show. We are generally smarter than rabbits. <laughs> we have one more question here, so. Uh, Peter, what do you think about the future of movements like the do-it-yourself molecular biology homebrew people? It's pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, I mean, there are a lot of trained molecular biologists. They've all been fired by Newman, and they're not going to get grants. And uh, they get really pissed off. They might sit in the garage and make a horrible flu virus. Uh, and they're making a really good point. They may think that if we depopulate the planet of humans, it's going to be better off. I try to run a novel and it's so awful and bad that I've never seen a lot of day. This is another novel I did, one of the really bad novels. Science novels are usually so awful. <laughs> and the, one, the most awful ones are written by science. <laughs> We're very lucky. Did you, do you have any equipment up here? No, I don't. Okay. Thanks so much. Cheers. Peter, it's been great. <laughs>